welcome to a brand new podcast. This is Everything with Everett, a podcast dedicated to hosting important conversations. Everything with Everett is hosted by Everett McConaughey from Boise, Idaho. Everett is an Idaho native who is ready to share his thoughts and observations on a wide variety of subjects. Politics, science, faith, religion, technology, and so much in between. How did we get here? What can we learn from each other? How can we put the past into a healthy conversation that helps us grow tomorrow? This is Everything with Everett, a conversation worth having. Good morning, everybody. Well, a morning for me anyway. It is Friday, November 20th, 2020. The wonderful saga of our year continues. Um, today's podcast, I would like to talk about the whole COVID situation, particularly COVID in Idaho. Um, things are getting a little bit crazy in our country. Um, on Wednesday, we passed the 250,000 American deaths due to COVID-19. And as of last night, we are now at 252,000 nationally. We've added 2,000 deaths in two days. It's kind of ridiculous. So, Also going to be introducing some new aspects to this podcast production. If you haven't visited the YouTube channel, Everett McConaughey, uh, you can find information on that on my website, everettmcconaughey.com. I am now producing a video version of the podcast. Not only does it contain the audio that you are listening on whatever podcasting platform you choose, it also has my wonderful mug. I say that tongue in cheek. Uh, has my mug on the video as well as I'm talking, so you can see it. I've also got a screen capture for my um, automation player for audio tracks. Uh, helps keep me on time so that I'm not over the 30 minute threshold. And starting today, not only am I offering audio clips of speeches and um, different things like I have in the past for the podcast version, but the video version, I now have the ability to show the entire um, video. Let me turn off the sound of this computer. I hadn't thought about that. It's the notification thing. Oh my god. Okay, I'm going to turn that on. Okay. So, if you go to the YouTube channel, uh, just search for Everett McConaughey, um, you should be able to find my uploads. I put them on a playlist called Everything with Everett. And um, going forward, you'll be able to see that full video version of whatever audio you're hearing on the podcast. So, and then also I'm going to do links to the videos in the YouTube description. So you'll be able to find out sources and save and share those individual videos for yourself as well. And before I get going too far, I'd like to do a quick plug for my wonderful sponsor, Buzzsprout. What's your podcast story? First, start with some gear that you already have and a quiet space. Then, register for Buzzsprout. You'll get a great-looking podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how and where people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and so much more. If you're wanting to upgrade your equipment, Buzzsprout has tons of guides to help you find the right equipment at the right price. Click the link in the show notes and let Buzzsprout know Everett sent you. You'll get a $20 Amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid plan, and you'll help support this show. Very thankful for Buzzsprout for the services that they provide, and I totally recommend them if you are thinking about starting a podcast. 
So this first clip that you'll hear on the podcast version and first video that you'll see on the YouTube version is a press conference from Washington State Governor Jay Inslee where he discusses the lack of COVID control for the state of Idaho and uh, pins some of the infection rate on for the Spokane area on Idaho's um, lack of action. It's obviously not, it's hard to prove whether it's straight up Idaho because uh, Spokane, Idaho is right next to Coeur d'Alene. So there's, they're pretty close to each other. They're essentially almost the same community. They're just different states from each other. So there's pro- there's a lot of crossover. Um, so I'm sure there is a correlation. Spokane does have the highest infection rate in all of Washington. So, which happens to be the same level as Idaho. And Idaho is at a point now where we're having to turn away patients in some of these more rural communities because we just don't have the capacity for them rather than to send them to uh, hospitals in Washington. So while I don't know that it's definitely hand in hand, there is an impact and that's worth discussing, noting, and acknowledging. So without further ado, here is the Washington governor discussing his thoughts on Idaho and then um, also some Feedback from KTVB's Kim Fields. Um, This was part of a program called The 208 that airs every afternoon at 5 p.m. on KTVB TV in Boise. Great program. They ask the hard questions. Brian Holmes and Kim Fields both do a great job. And uh, enjoy. Usually on this show, we stick with topics happening in the 208, but with so much happening all around us, we wanted to recap something that might affect us here in the gym state. First off, Utah. Last week, last week, Utah's governor enacted a statewide mask mandate to help curb the spread of COVID-19. Then on Friday, Oregon Governor Kate Brown issued a two-week freeze on group activities. Things like gyms and salons and restaurants will close for indoor dining beginning Wednesday. And then yesterday, Washington Governor Jay Inslee followed suit, ordering places like gyms, salons and restaurants to close their indoor operations. But when someone asked Inslee how the closure will be enforced specifically in border towns where Washington residents can drive across the border into Idaho to shop and eat. Well, the governor didn't hold back. I have urged the Idaho leaders to show some leadership. One of the reasons we have such jammed up hospitals in Spokane is because Idaho, uh, frankly, has not done some of the things that we have found successful. I was stunned at the same week where I heard that Idaho from Kootenai County may ship patients here to Oregon, that they'd abandoned their mask requirement. That's just irresponsible. I I don't know what else to say about it. So we hope Idaho over time will be more uh, aggressive and uh, and responsible, frankly, to reduce the, the burden on the Spokane medical system. Okay, so Inslee is pretty fired up there, but does he have a leg to stand on? According to the Spokane Regional Health District, right now hospitals in the region are nearing 60 to 65% capacity. Those hospitals are about 20 miles from the state line, 30 miles from Coeur d'Alene. Unfortunately, there's no way to know because of HIPAA how many hospitalized patients in Spokane are Idahoans or if they somehow contracted the virus in Idaho. We reached out to Governor Little for a response to Governor Inslee's comments. His office responded this afternoon saying, quote, Idaho's health officials have been mindful of the challenges of mitigating spread of COVID-19 in border communities since the onset of the pandemic. The positivity rate is mirrored on both sides of the border. We advise citizens to follow the laws and recommendations of their state. So does Governor Inslee have a leg to stand on? Are they mirrored? Well, let's look at numbers that we can compare. Currently, Idaho's positivity rate is at an all-time high of 16.9%. That's up more than 2% week over week. Kootenai County, that's the county Governor Inslee mentioned, they're at 18.3%. As for Washington State, their positivity rate is currently 7.2%. 
Their high was back in early April at 8.1%. However, looking at the gray bars, you can see the difference in the amount of tests conducted. More tests are being conducted now compared to months ago. Now, if we look at just Spokane County's positivity rate alone, that's 15.6%. That's about the same as Idaho's rate, and they're both about double the positivity rate of the entire state of Washington. So can Inslee blame it all on Idaho? I'll let you answer that one at home. Washington, by the way, has had stricter mandates since the pandemic started, even during the summer when things seem to be settling down. So definitely some correlation to the situation over there um and he does have a point we are having where our infection rate is exploding our governor has this entire time since this spring said that encouraged personal responsibility as he calls it um we've moved back from a stage four um to a quote modified stage two or three i don't want to say two but essentially nothing has changed. Literally nothing has changed. Um, there's still stores require, say that they require you to wear a mask, but there's no enforcement. Um, there's no state mandate. Um, there's frankly counties in this state that if you don't want to wear a mask, no one's wearing a mask. And then there's the peer pressure of you don't want to be the only one wearing a mask because then you get called a sheep and you frankly get um, barraged by these conservative minded individuals who don't think that the governor has that power or frankly don't care about uh, the public health of their fellow citizens and contrary to how they think they act they're behaving very unpatriotically so this next video I an audio clip that I'd like to share with you guys is a nurse um she spoke to ktvb's brian holmes and talked about how the naysayers have impacted um her and her co-workers uh, care for these individuals the goal, of course, is to keep these increasing numbers from filling up our hospitals, from overwhelming doctors and nurses with COVID patients, or taking them away from other patients. And by all local accounts, that's already happening. The latest statewide data showing nearly 400 people with COVID are taking up a bed in a hospital. And it's not the beds or the equipment that are necessarily in short supply, but the staff and the expertise needed to outfit not only intensive care units, but the other units as well. St. Luke's Magic Valley is one of the hardest hit hospitals when it comes to this issue. Not enough space, not enough staff. So they've had to send patients to Boise. Ryan Sharp works as a registered nurse at that Twin Falls Hospital. She has for the past two and a half years. She's what is known as a float nurse, meaning she works in whatever unit she is needed. And sometimes that's the rehab unit. Sometimes it's the postpartum unit. Sometimes it's the intermediate care or the, inter yeah, the intermediate care unit, which is connected to the ICU. She told us today all of them, all of those units hospital wide are understaffed right now with almost all of the nurses having to pull extra shifts. She also told us all of them have heard the comments either directly from the public or shared on social media. The hospitals are lying. They're just making money off COVID cases, which is why she felt the need to write a post for Facebook last week, because while St. Luke's Magic Valley may not be technically overwhelmed right now, she and her colleagues certainly are. Sad, tired, frustrated, and angry is how she started that post to defend the profession she chose as a little girl. And despite the current conditions and desperation, it's still a job she loves. My favorite part is seeing people get better and go home. And um, that's not happening right now. From when you started there to the, the pandemic that we're in, even from the start of the pandemic to now, that being able to send people home, how's that changed? Um, from March to now, it has been rough. We, we don't see that as often. And when we do, we are all clapping and cheering and we're pretty excited, especially for the ones that have been there for a long time. I can see this is difficult for you. 
isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's it's a hard topic to talk about because the whole reason that I'm even here is because I have people that I know that don't believe that this is true. And people that I know think that the hospital isn't telling the truth. And that makes mean, means that I'm not telling the truth. And so it hurts a little bit. That skepticism even extends to some patients who didn't believe COVID was a thing until it was a thing that sent them to the hospital. I have heard that, yep, that they don't believe it until they're in that situation. Then what do they say? Um, when they're there, you know, they're probably the most thankful patients that we've had, but they're also the most scared patients that we have. Um, and that's hard for us to see too, um, especially because their families can't be at the bedside right now. And so we are the only faces that they see because we're masked. So they don't even really get to see us. Is that the reason you wanted to post what you did on Facebook last week? Um, it is. Yeah. I needed to get my voice out there. And when it comes to your coworkers being the only people who understand you, but you know that your coworkers literally cannot take on any more than what they're dealing with. You can't vent to them anymore. You can't use them as an outlet like we used to be able to. And when it's people that your acquaintances with that are saying these things, you, you try to get it out any way that you can without burdening other people. I wanted to let people know that we're still here and we are still fighting for people's lives every day. This third paragraph that you wrote, I'm not afraid anymore. I will show up every shift, work extra to help my coworkers and pray that there is an end near. I don't want to argue about masks anymore. I just hope that when the time comes that you need us, know that we'll be there and we'll fight for you, even when you're giving up on us. Do you feel like you're being given up on? I do. I feel like the community is giving up on us. I feel like, um, I, yeah, as a hospital standpoint, we are stronger now than ever. Um, I have never felt more supported and that sounds kind of cheesy, but seriously, um, I've never felt more supported from my job, but I, the community is, they are giving up on us. They just, it's whether it's a non-belief thing, whether it's a not wanting to wear a mask thing, whether I don't even know anymore, but COVID is still here. It didn't go away when the election happened. It's not going anywhere anytime soon from what we see every day. What is the state? You, you say in your post, you check on your friends in the medical field. Is there a concern on your part and even for yourself that it's taking its toll on you guys emotionally? The loss, every time we lose a patient, to COVID anytime we lose a patient in general right now, because it's not what it used to be. There aren't family members at bedside. We kind of carry those and we have to kind of do it silently because we can't really burden our coworkers with any more than what we already are. That's a side of it that I didn't really, didn't really hit me until just now that because of the restrictions on visitation and stuff like that, sometimes you're the last human that these people connect with. Yep. That's a lot on you. It has been, yeah. Or we're, you know, we're fighting to get that last Facebook, you know, FaceTime set up um, with their family before before it happens. Um, and, and it's hard. If there was one thing that you could change in all of this in the last eight months, what would that be? Do you want my honest opinion? Yes, I do. Um, as a nurse who has been at the bedside since March with COVID patients, I want our friends and families back for our patients. Personally, I think that would make a difference. Even if it was little, it would make a difference. It wasn't to hire more nurses. It wasn't more personal protection equipment. It wasn't even to wish to make people believe this is actually real. Ryan just wants to care for people and help them get better. And right now, it's being made difficult, she says, by a lack of compliance from the community to do all they can to stop the spread of the coronavirus. But she's not quitting. Today was her day off, and after getting as much rest as one can get with an 11-month-old in the house, Ryan will be back to work tomorrow. And hopefully, she'll be sending patients home better than they were when they came in. 
it's quite uh, touching to hear the shaking of the voice and the the frustration that these nurses have, and then the gall on top of that that we have citizens in our nation and our states and communities that still believe the do-nothing rhetoric of the conservative party um, and they're not educating themselves. They're denying this is real until they get it. And then, like she said, even when they're in the hospital, they're still like, how can this happen? This isn't supposed to be real. And they're just blown away. But it's costing people's lives. 252,000 people as of yesterday. And the next third clip I have for you is a gov or not governor a uh, Idaho doctor in eastern Idaho talking about how Idaho is on the verge of having to start rationing care because we are so short on critical hospital beds Last spring, when COVID-19 was in its infancy, there was a group of 14 physicians, community representatives, and lawyers and staff members with Idaho Department of Health and Welfare coming up with a plan. A plan for what to do if the state's hospital capacity reaches a crisis level. Dr. Kenneth Krell with Eastern Idaho Regional Medical Center was part of that group. He told me today essentially what it may come down to is a scoring system to decide which patient gets the medical care they need and deserve and which one doesn't. This has been a rather grim, morbid task for us to undertake to decide how we would allocate resources when they become too scarce to be allocated to all deserving patients. So we can't just look at the number of ICU beds that we've got available. What we have to look at is the number of staff that are available to take care of those patients. And we are quickly running out of staff in this state. And essentially the crisis standards is like a scoring system doctor with points assigned to a patient. And then that determines if and when they'll be getting the care if it gets to that point. There are uh, a lot of guidelines out there that, that we looked at and adapted, and that includes such things as what's the patient's likelihood of, re of surviving uh, on an immediate basis. And if they don't have a, a likelihood of surviving compared to someone else, then they're going to be um, allocated to comfort care, that is to make them comfortable. And then if you end up with a tie, you have a number of tiebreakers, pregnant women, uh, not having been through all of your life cycles. That is a way uh, uh, to allocate based on age, uh, a number of others. And then if you have a tie that results uh, at that point, then there's a lottery system to decide who gets exhausting. the scarce resource. You know, are you being an alarmist or are we really close? to having to implement this type of crisis standard? I think it's telling that Governor Little has uh, essentially stated, he's the first one who used that term, that we are at a tipping point. But again, going back to this, this crisis standard, and if I walk into a hospital, well, no, you have that, well, no, let, let's take them instead, they're worse off or they're better off. I mean, how close are we to coming to that here in Idaho? We're not exactly sure. We are meeting as a SIDMAC committee tomorrow to discuss those issues, but clearly what we hear from around the state is that resources are stretched as far as we can and that we are approaching uh, uh, the limitation of what we can provide in terms of the usual care that we provide. I just can't even believe we've come to this. We have, unfortunately. The widespread presence of COVID-19 in Idaho is already limiting the type of usual health care that's provided. Beginning today, St. Luke's temporarily stopped elective surgeries and procedures that require an overnight stay. No surgeries like hysterectomy.
miss knee replacements for the next six weeks. And St. Alphonsa says they have begun to selectively limit certain surgical procedures at their Boise Hospital. The problem, as you heard Dr. Krell talk about, it's not so much the actual space or the number of beds or the equipment or the ventilators, it's staffing. Bree Sandow, Director of Resource and Staffing at St. Luke's, told me they're out more than 100 staff today. So what do you do when you're 100 employees short? That's an excellent question. We have exceptional teamwork, so that is the start of how we have come around this really consistently day after day. But there's a few different tactics. Um, the most obvious one is we ask other staff to work extra. St. Luke's is currently experiencing the highest numbers of staff illness and staff out with COVID-19 since the pandemic began in March. The hospital is relying on their float pool of resources, their backup nurses, and they've called in traveling contract nurses from out of state, but even those are hard to come by. And so when those nurses have been working in these same skill sets, med, surge, ED, critical care, consistently since March, they're exhausted. And so what we've really seen now is an issue of supply and demand, where these nurses um, are tired, they're fatigued, and they're not wanting to extend contracts or pick up new contracts before the holidays. They wanna go home and they wanna take a break. And so that has presented another level of complexity because historically, it has not been this much of a challenge to bring in external nurses. And then how do we incentivize our existing nurses, but in a way that, um, that they aren't overly fatigued or burned out. Um, and that's a really fine balance in terms of being able to meet our patient care needs. Let's talk about that, that burning out um, and, and not working them too hard. We hear of airline pilots. The FAA says you can fly this many hours and then you're grounded. Are there regulations like that in place for healthcare workers, for nurses, for doctors? So there are not legal regulations in place um, in the same way that there are for the FAA, although that's an excellent example. And as healthcare workers, we often look to those practices as important guidelines um, for the care that we provide. At St. Luke's, we do have guidelines in place that we utilize under normal circumstances in terms of both the number of hours someone can work within 24 hours, the number of hours they need off between shifts, and the number of hours they can work in consecutive days. What I can say though, is that when we are pushed to a point where we don't have the healthcare providers available for the volumes, we have to adjust. And so we're not able to maintain those same guidelines consistently. We have been incredibly intentional in getting the resources that we need to safely care for the patient, but not utilizing additional resources beyond that. We understand that in terms of COVID and winter, this is going to be a marathon and not a sprint. And so we are very cognizant of caring for our staff and wanting um, them to care for themselves. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to leave it there. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Everything with Everett. I hope you have a great week, and it's been a pleasure to join you wherever we are. Stay safe, stay healthy, and let's keep moving through this together. You can join the conversation anytime. Call or text 208-391-2808. Also, you can connect on Twitter. Look for at Everett Podcast. Listen to all available episodes of Everything with Everett, as well as find out where to subscribe. More information at everettmcconaughey.com forward slash podcast. <laughs>